the engineering standards change. Now, when we're talking about nearby weapon, when you're talking a hydrogen bomb, um, nearby is a very relative thing. The weapon on top of our Titan II is a 9.2 megaton yield hydrogen bomb, the largest weapon ever put on an intercontinental ballistic missile by the United States. The Russian weapons were even bigger. Their smallest weapon, as far as we know, is about 10 megatons. A lot of them range between 20 and 25 megatons. Now, a 25 megaton weapon landing within a mile and a half or two miles up here is going to be a direct hit. This is going to be a big smoldering hole in the ground, and that's it. 10 megatons within a mile, however, or 20 megatons within a couple miles, this facility would probably survive, and that's because of the way that it's designed. First off, to withstand the number one thing that happens during a, uh, a detonation of an atomic weapon, the electromagnetic pulse that knocks out all the electrical and electronic equipment, they left the forms in place for, from when they poured the concrete. And they're up here, and you'll notice they're a little unusual because you'll see seams in them. Now the concrete was poured in a continuous pour so there weren't any weeks or gaps or spots in it that, uh, that didn't have the appropriate strength, but the form itself is quarter-inch thick steel plate. In fact, the entire facility, once we get inside this wall, is encased in at least a quarter-inch of steel, and all of that steel is grounded to the earth. In fact, there's a little ground wire up here. Most of them are much larger than this. But what it does is it makes the whole facility a Faraday shield, a Faraday cage, and that absorbs and allows that electromagnetic pulse that accompanies a nearby detonation to be spread into the earth and it's not going to fry our electronics. All right? That takes care of one of the problems of a nearby detonation. The other thing that's going to happen is there's going to be heat and blast effects, including radiation. And the way they dealt with that was the way they built everything. The walls here are four feet thick. The ceilings and floors are five feet thick. We talked about a half or a quarter inch steel placed in the outer skin of the facility. Most places where there's a floor, there's a half inch of steel plate underneath it. There's a forest of reinforcing bar inside everything that's here. It's much more closely spaced. Most of the rebar you'll see on construction sites nowadays isn't quite as big around as my laser pointer. The smallest that they used here, and they used very little of it, is as big around as my thumb. Most of it is the size of my wrist or forearm, and any place it intersects, it's welded together, not just wire tied makes an extremely strong facility. So that takes care of the heat and the blast. Now, the other thing that's going to happen because of the, the power of the weapons involved is that there's going to be an earthquake. And the reason there's going to be an earthquake is the dynamic of a hydrogen bomb going off above you is the same thing as if you take a rock or a boulder and drop it into a perfectly calm body of water. And I'm sure you've all seen photographs of that where you drop it in and then all of a sudden there's a little spike of water coming up and there are waves moving out away from it. Well, hydrogen bomb goes up, the same thing happens. The spike of water coming up, however, is the mushroom cloud and that could be miles and miles high. The waves going out from it are the compression of the earth and the air. The air has been compressed as, as hard as steel and those things are moving away from the detonation site at the speed of sound and so the earthquake is going to be epic. And the way they took care of that was a real simple method that they referred to as shock isolation. Now, the crew had to be protected from all this stuff, so everything was strengthened. Um, the metric that they used was that the building was hardened to withstand an overpressure of 300 pounds per square inch. Now, that doesn't mean anything to you unless I put it in perspective by letting you know that an overpressure of 3 to 5 pounds per square inch will flatten virtually every frame home. That's the overpressure that's created by a hurricane or a tornado. 10 pounds per square inch is going to flatten every city, concrete and steel. You get above 12 pounds per square inch, it kills all animal life. This is meant to withstand 300 pounds per square inch. In fact, this door, which weighs three tons, is actually meant to withstand an overpressure of 1,000 pounds per square inch. And this was closed when the crew came in and came down the stairs. They would have to make their last phone call from the phone over here. That's the one you saw in the video where Chuck picked it up and said, This is Chuck. I'm at uh, Blast Door 6. Please let me in. The crew on duty would have to activate the open switch here, which then would be pushed. It would retract these gigantic pins from sockets in the door, 
and then the door could be opened, and it normally would be opened by the lowest ranking member of the crew because it weighs three tons, and the officers certainly aren't going to move something like that. So the other cool thing about the doors, though, is to make sure that the protection was uninterrupted. If this door was open, blast door number seven could not be open. One had to be closed all the time, and so the crew would move all their stuff into this blast lock area. Please follow me in here. This is the blast lock area. This is blast door number seven. There are switches that would indicate when blast door number six is closed, and they would also have to push a button over here that would put those pins back into the door. Upstairs is the crew quarters that you saw in the video. They talked about the fact that it's fairly spartan up there. There's a pair of bunk beds, a rudimentary kitchen with a stove, a sink, and a fridge. And then there's a toilet and a shower. Um, if you've ever been to Motel 6, it's Motel 1.25 up there. That's, it's not a, not a comfy place to be. But the crew was here for 24 hours. They had lots of work to do, and it was loud, hot, and noisy in here. And so they probably wouldn't have gotten a lot of sleep. This is where everything was checked to make sure that it worked properly. This is where all the communications came in. Down below us on the third level is a bunch of equipment that was required to support everything else that was here. And that equipment ranged from really mundane things like a sewage ejector pump to compressors that would compress nitrogen to 3,500 pounds per square inch for opening up the silo door and some other fairly exotic radio filters and other things. So anyhow, you're inside a three-story building, has to be shock isolated because everything in here is so important and yet you look around, you don't see anything hanging on springs and that's because the whole building is hanging on springs. This entire three-story building is hanging on eight gigantic springs around the perimeter <coughs> And actually, as we walked in here, there was a little bridge that you walked over, like a little hump in the floor about this wide. That covers up. For some reason, in 1977, the Congress and the Pentagon had an, I call it an epiphany of sorts. I'm both out of the blue, where I was like, whoa, wait a minute. There's no good reason why we can't allow women to participate in certain combat roles. And so, the very first combat role they allowed women to participate in was being responsible for the largest hydrogen bomb we ever put on top of a gigantic ICBM Titan II. All right. And you represent those women. As a matter of fact, our museum director, Yvonne Morris, was a captain in the Air Force with the 390th Strategic Missile Wing stationed out of Davis Monthan Air Force Base. And during her duty tours, she sat in that very chair as a missile combat crew commander. So you represent all those women, and that's why you're sitting there, all right? Um, now, your counterpart was a deputy commander. By the way, your duties were very general. We're here to let you know the major systems here on the, in the facility. This is communications equipment. You actually even have targeting information over here, all right? So, you had all this stuff, you had the lights that tell you if something is going wrong. The deputy commander, uh, by the way, the commander typically was a captain or a major. The deputy was a first or second lieutenant trying to get the experience to sit in that chair eventually. That person's responsibilities were much more well-defined. He or she was 
responsible for safety, security, and communication. Now we talked about communication up above, all the radio systems that were up there, and the redundant antennas to make sure they worked all the time. These are the receivers for all those radios. This is what's connected to that hoop-shaped antenna out in the parking lot, the single sideband shortwave radio. This is the one that was connected to the primary communications radio with Strategic Air Command Headquarters, and that would either come from Strategic Air Command Headquarters in Omaha or uh, the 15th Air Force in Riverside, California. There's filtering equipment down below us that would actually pick out the strongest signal and make sure that that was what was sent up here and it would be broadcast over this pair of speakers on the commander's console and the one over here on the deputy commander's and they were really, really annoying because you couldn't turn them down and every time a message came in it made this noise. You heard that 50 times a day and this area stunk, literally, all right? Because it was the 1960s, Commander, you'll notice you've got your ash tree here built into your console. This was the only room where people could smoke except for upstairs. Chuck mentioned in the video that people who could cook were highly prized, which means a lot of people were upstairs who didn't know how to cook. And so if somebody burned the Brussels sprouts, that smell would linger in here for quite a while. So it was hot, it was noisy, you had that thing going off all the time, and you had a lot of stuff to do. So. Um, in addition to being responsible for the communications equipment, the assistant or the, uh, the deputy commander was also responsible for safety and security. He had to know who was on site. He had to make sure that people coming in belonged here. In fact, the only closed circuit TV camera is on the stairway coming in, and that's seen on this monitor up here. The crews virtually all knew one another. If there was an interloper in one of the crews, all the deputy had to do was not push the button that opens the door in the entrapment area. They'd all be stuck in there until the air police came in and sorted it out. So when the appropriate personnel did come in, he'd keep track of them on a locator board here, where they were at, who they were, what they were doing. And he did it with one of these, and everybody had one. This is a grease pencil. It's a predecessor to the dry erase marker and the whiteboard. That's how everybody kept track of things. Wrote it on here with the grease pencil, then they were done, they wiped it off with a rag. That was it. Okay. Another thing the deputy had to do was he had to take care of this clock. Now once again, keep going back, this is early 1960s technology that was employed here. There were no quartz movements in electric clocks yet. There was no such thing as an accurate electric clock. What they had to have to be accurate was a chronometer. You can review or view that thing as a big, expensive Rolex because it's built to the same standard. It's a very, very high precision timepiece, and it's a 24-hour clock with a seven-day movement that gets wound up every Sunday by whoever is assistant, or I mean, uh, deputy combat crew commander on that day. In addition to that, that clock is checked against the atomic clock in Boulder, Colorado, twice per shift to make sure that it's within about one second of that clock, as is every other clock in the United States military, because if we ever did have to retaliate, there were so many weapons involved that that retaliation had to be orchestrated to keep things from literally running into one another. All right? So, I also notice the time on that thing is wrong. It says that it's... Uh, that 2145, GMT? all right, which is correct somewhere else. It's certainly not the time in Tucson. Anybody know where it is the correct time? GMT. GMT, zero meridian Zulu time in the military. Now it's known as the universal coordinated time or UTC on your computer. But this allows the entire military to be in, on the same page at the same time, time-wise. Because there's no AM, there's no PM, there's no time zones, there's no daylight savings time. It's the same time here, right now, as it is up on the International Space Station and in Guam or the Philippines and Moscow and any other place. All right? They all use that time standard. So that's what the officer and the deputy did. The two enlisted personnel that were here with them were actually much more highly trained. The officer and the deputy just had to figure out what decisions to make, and if something lit up on your console, you would confer with the enlisted. They weren't going to go out and fix anything. All right. And so after determining what the problem was, say it was with the building system, the first person you would talk to was a guy known as the MFT, the Missile Facilities Technician. He was responsible for everything here except the missile. 
the buildings here have 40 major systems in there with a multitude of subsystems in them, ranging from the drains and the sink and the kitchen to the systems that produce the 3,500 PSI compressed nitrogen that's used to open the silo doors and also to pull the pins in and out of the blast doors. You had to know all that stuff. Telephone systems, everything else, and everything, to, all the communication was done by wired telephone. In fact, your, your telephone is right here. Uh, we don't have any real young folks. It's cool to see 20-year-old or even younger kids come in and we point at that and say, what is that thing? I never saw one of those before in my life, so anyhow. But um, the missile facilities technician had to know all those systems. He also had to keep track of the electric power company, which came from the grid. Now, uh, when the facility was first built, we were out in the middle of nowhere. Um, there was no Sarita, no Green Valley. The only road going past was Nogales Highway, which was a two-lane dirt road. And during monsoon season, they knew the power was going to go out. They also knew that the number one tactic during a nuclear confrontation is you detonate a weapon high in the atmosphere above your adversary, whether you're attacking or retaliating, because that sets out an electromagnetic pulse that takes out their entire electric grid and all of their electronic equipment. All right? uh, in fact, if there was one set off over Kansas, it would take out the whole grid for the United States, Canada, and Mexico. That's how effective that is. And so recognizing that, they built a gigantic generator into level three of the silo. Uh, great big six-cylinder diesel engine, generates 350 kilowatts of electric power, more than enough to take care of things. So the problem is, however, that our missile um, has a number of little gyroscopes and accelerometers in it. They let the missile know where it is. And if the power gets interrupted and the power going to the missile stops or slows down even for a microsecond, the missile will forget where it is, and if it forgets where it is, it's not going to be able to find its target and destroy it. And so we have to reprogram everything. The way they took care of that was the incoming power came in, got converted to 28 volt direct current, which is the standard for aircraft power supplies. Our missile is an aircraft, just doesn't have any wings on it. And then goes out to the uh, missile, everything here that's in seafoam green is 28 volts, and a portion of that power gets funneled off into a couple of big batteries that are down below us. Those batteries are wired in parallel with the incoming power, so if the incoming power drops out, those lines are already filled with the electrons from the batteries. There is no interruption in power. The missile doesn't forget where it is. If it has to be launched, it can be done simply with the batteries, and it's going to know where to go and what to destroy and how to do it when it gets there. Okay? Now, the missile facilities technician's counterpart, we talked about him real briefly, was known as the BMAT, the Ballistic Missile Analyst Technician. He was the technical guy. Wasn't really a computer person because there weren't any computers yet, but he did have to know how to allow the missile to digitally communicate between what was going on in here and what it had to do out in the silo before it was launched, and that's why he had all of this equipment. This panel let him know and let him do diagnostic testing of every system on the missile. Once again, there's a piece of plastic on top of it. It was so noisy in here that if people wanted to know what he was doing, he would write it across the front of this with his grease pencil so people wouldn't have to try to yell at him to be heard to find out what was going on. This a lot of people call the go to war panel because this showed the status of the reentry vehicle how the weapon would be detonated when it got to its target, and it also has the fail-safe device that prevents the missile from accidentally or inadvertently being launched. They talked about that in the video. This is the butterfly valve lock control, and on the first stage of the missile, there are four lines that carry fuel and oxidizer to the first stage engine. All four of them have to be filled with the appropriate fluid for the engine to fire. One of them has a valve on it that looks like this. This is a cutaway, and when it's closed, it's like this. For the fluid to flow through, it has to open like that, but one of them has a pin in it that keeps it from opening unless the correct code is put in that device. That code is never kept here, and it's never at the command center at davis Monthan. The only time we would ever receive it is during a launch order from the President of the United States. And to prevent someone from trying to figure it on their own, figure it out on their own, they made it fairly complicated. There's only six wheels here, but each wheel has 16 characters on it. So, Commander, you're real smart. You're the commander. What's 16 to the sixth power? <laughs> <laughs> See, it's a 
a lot. It's a lot, that's correct. <laughs> 16,700,000 plus possible combinations, only one of which is going to work. So, excellent. Good security system. Not satisfactory for the Strategic Air Command. So, the other thing they did to this was they put in an attempts counter. You get seven tries to get the code in correctly. After that, this thing commits electronic suicide. You can't launch your missile, all right? I think part of the reason they did that is if the BMAT had to put this in as part of the launch, his hand might have been shaking a bit, and so they wanted to give them the opportunity. That wasn't enough security either. So the other thing they did was this was the only device in the whole facility that was hardwired to the command center at Davis Mountain Air Force Base. It had to be tested like everything else here, and when it was tested, they would call the command center saying, we're going to test the butterfly valve lock control, and then they had a list of cheat codes over here that they could enter into it to make sure that it was working correctly. So they'd call up and say, all right, we're going to test the butterfly valve block. We're going to use code number six. They would dial that one in, and that would let them do it. If this was touched any other time without prior notification, your phone would ring. There would be a very upset colonel who would want to have a serious talk with you after your shift was over. So that's the way they prevented the missile from being accidentally launched. Now, correct, target two is illuminated. That's our primary target. To get the targeting information into the missile, they had this gigantic thing called the MGAC. This is the Missile Guidance Alignment Checkout Group. This was full of state-of-the-art electronics when the facility first went in. Fortunately, over time, they ran out of spare parts. They wanted to keep the system going. And so they went from all of this and reduced it down to where it fit in this one panel. When all this was full of state-of-the-art electronics, and it had a massive 4K of processing power. By the time they got to this, it went all the way up to 16. And the reason they used this was they ran out of parts for the original system. This was known as the Universal Space Guidance System. It was developed for the Boeing 747, so it could fly intercontinental distances without benefit of GPS, which didn't exist yet, or really advanced electronics. But they had already adapted this thing to put things into orbit with a Titan III, which was just a variant of a Titan II, and so it was pretty much a no-brainer making it work. Now, Let's talk about your targets for a minute. You said target two is our default because it's lit up here. Tell me everything you know about target two. That's the correct answer, all right? <laughs> the crews didn't know anything about their target. This is not a B-52. We're not flying to the target and destroying it. We have a missile that knows how to get there and what it's supposed to do when it gets there. And the way it knows that is it's programmed using the latest 19th century technology, punch paper tape. No. Stuff just like this is in Mylar because we handle it, but tape just like this was used back in the 1840s to program Jacquard wheat looms in London to make really fancy fabrics. And over the next 50 years it received technical upgrades to where it was about this wide and it could play tunes on a player piano. The reason that it's used is it's extremely secure. It's a piece of paper. You can't give it a virus. Couldn't care less about magnetism or electrical fields. Every one of these programmers is encoded by its user. And so when you put information into it, it has to end up with the right number of holes. Some of the holes are just there to be counted. Other ones contain information. And if it's got the wrong number of holes, it's not going to read it. So if you punch an extra hole in it, it's not going to read it. You try to hack some other information into it, you don't know how many bits you've taken in or out. It's not going to read it. Very, very secure. And that's how they got the information in. The only thing that we do know about our targets, however, is contained in one of the BMATS panels over here. And that is the re-entry vehicle monitor, all right? RV monitor, once again, not a Winnebago. It's got a hydrogen bomb in it. And there are two ways of detonating this weapon. Now, first off, a nine megaton hydrogen bomb is 650 times more powerful than the weapons that were used against the Japanese that ended World War II. 650 times more powerful. If you were to load 9 million tons of TNT, which is a granular material, onto a bunch of railroad hopper cars, the train would stretch from Tucson to the Canadian border, 1,200 miles away. That's how much material it is. As far as destructive force, if it's detonated as an airburst, that means that it's trying to take out things like a shipping port or a big port where there's submarines with uh, nuclear-capable submarines, uh, petroleum processing facilities, major communication centers, manufacturing facilities, things like that. 
the weapon would be detonated so that the fireball from it doesn't touch the ground. The fireball from a nine megaton weapon is three miles in diameter, so the weapon gets detonated 14,000 feet above the ground, all the energy from it slams down, hits the ground, and destroys an area of about 1,000 square miles. Right. In other words, you draw a circle on a map, 35 miles around it, everything inside that circle is gone. Now, our target, however, is said to be a ground burst, which means there's something underground there that has to be taken up. That's probably a command and control center with a bunch of generals and communications equipment, or maybe a stash of additional nuclear weapons. But whatever it is, it's buried in the ground, and so the weapon, instead of de detonating 14,000 feet in the air, detonates at ground level and instantly vaporizes a hole in the ground 45 to 50 stories deep, about 500 feet, and anywhere from a half to three quarters of a mile in diameter. Big hole. In fact, if you've ever seen pictures of Meteor Crater up near Winslow, Arizona, that's a nine megaton hole. That's how powerful this thing is. So, crews down here doing their thing, making sure everything is ready to go, and they hear this again. Now this message was different. Every message is headed off by a preamble. And the Alpha 2 preamble means that it's a launch order. So the commander would have immediately picked up her emergency action message book. The deputy would have done the same thing. And they would have started copying down what was being broadcast with their grease pencil. The announcer would broadcast a 35 character message. And then he would say, and I say again, and then pause for a moment. And as soon as that happened, we would exchange our books so we could check one another's work. When the broadcast or when the message was broadcast the second time, we realized we had copied everything correctly. We said the message is verified. We have to authenticate it, at which time we would have gone over here and taken our lots off of the emergency war order safe. Inside was a number of documents that would have helped us figure out the launch time for the missile, the butterfly valve lock code so the missile could be launched. But most important, we had to make sure that that message came from the only person who could authorize use of our hydrogen bomb, the President of the United States. And in this message, there's an authentication line that starts out with a two-character code. I'm just going to pull one here at random. We'll say the code was 9Y, 9Yankee. So we would pull out the authentication card that says 9Yankee, crack it open, and inside would be a little ticket with another code on it that starts out with 9Y, 9Yankee, and then it's got five other characters after it. If that matched exactly to what was on the authentication line, what it meant was peace through deterrence had failed. We were under attack from the Soviet Union, and we had been ordered by the President to launch our Titan II missile. Now, there wasn't a whole lot of time to think about it. It was always considered that Titan II would have been one of the first ones out of here. We wanted to get those on the way to the Soviet Union to let them know that we had been serious about their being mutually assured destruction as an alternative to peace through deterrence, and so the missile had to be launched. Two things that were taken out of here along with the other documentation were keys. Your key is here, Commander, and I have one over here. They're seven and a half feet apart, so there's no way that one person can turn them both at the same time, yet they have to be turned simultaneously, and they have to be held for a few seconds in order to initiate the launch sequence. So, you're going to grab your key with your left hand, and don't do it yet, because you blow us all up. <laughs> but you need to grab it with your left hand because you need to see this row of lights. What you're going to do is turn it to the right. It's going to hit a stop right about here, and you're going to hold it until you see this first light light up. All right? So I'll give you a count in just a moment. All right? On my mark, three, two, one. Turn your key and hold it. <coughs> let me know when the light lights up. Okay. Okay, let go. You're done. What do the lights say? Launch enabled. Launch enabled. There is no oops button. You cannot undo what's been done. You pull the trigger on a rifle, there's a nine megaton bullet coming out of it, and it's going to go to target number two. And in a few, well, in a half hour, target number two is going to disappear. What the missile's doing is going through an automated launch sequence. The batteries are being filled with electrolyte for the first time. That's going to allow it to generate its own 28 volt power. Then when that happens, the auxiliary power system comes on, the silo doors start to open, they go through the tipsy devices up there. We know the silo has gone soft, it's open so the missile can be launched. 
We get a guidance goal, which means the missile talks to the MAGAC for the last time. It knows where it goes and what it has to do. The engines are going to fire. They're going to set off all the fire alarms in the launch silo. Just like that. After about four seconds, the engines get up to 77% of their motion and thrust the explosive bolts that hold them down, let go, and the missile is on its way to target two. 58 seconds after we turn the keys, Titan two is on its way to target number two, and in about half an hour, or half an hour, target two will cease to exist. So, you could read what it says in red on that for me. I turned the key. She admitted it. So we're going to go out to the silo and see whether our missile is still there. I'm running a little I bit long. The key. If you Itself. 
The sonic energy from 440,000 pounds of thrust would rupture the skin of a missile in a heartbeat if it wasn't dealt with in one way or another, and they had to use a couple ways. First off, during the launch sequence, down at the very bottom of the missile, there are nozzles that are pointed directly at the exhaust bells on the missile engines. During the launch sequence, they start dumping in water at 150 gallons a second, so by the time the engines ignite, the flames, instead of bouncing off concrete, rattling around and making a lot of sonic shock waves, Land, a, land in a pool of water, and the energy is consumed by the process of generating steam. Okay, it takes a lot of the energy away. In fact, any space launch you've ever watched, and you see the engines ignite, whether it's a space shuttle or one of the newer United Launch Alliance or a SpaceX flight, the big cloud of stuff you see coming out is always steam, because whether they're launching it from inside a silo or outdoors, the sonic energy created by modern day rocket engines will destroy what they're trying to launch if they don't attenuate the sound. Now, in our case, that's not quite enough. So if you look at the silo walls, you'll see boxes in there that look like they have a soft surface on them. That's because those are boxes that have a soft surface on them. It's actually, those are boxes that are about a foot deep and they have fiberglass insulation in them. They're the world's biggest glass pack muffler. All right, the launch duct is 146 feet deep. It's completely aligned with those boxes. They absorb the rest of the sound that had not been attenuated by the uh, hydraulic, the water sound attenuation, and the sum total of that allows the missile to get up and out of the silo without having destroyed itself on the way. So uh, we had 54 of these things. Now, the other thing I want to point out, because people often ask what this thing over here is, and the technical term for that is that. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my Oh, man, it's so light. It's so light. You know, aluminum. Yeah.